All right, so hello. Um, I did remember to start the screencast, as you can see. Uh, today's the last lecture of the class right now, today. There will be no more lectures after the um, except for the roughly 18 or so presentations that you're going to give next week. A reminder, turn in your last homework assignment tonight at midnight. That homework assignment simply is some rough draft of your final project. Um, any reasonable submission will get a perfect grade. Where reasonable is defined in a reasonable way. <laughs> okay, um, so that's those reminders. Uh, on Monday there won't be any class. I encourage you to use the extra time to polish up your final projects. Um, at the, during class I'll be a juror for a trial. Um, on Wednesday and Friday, we'll have the final presentations. Not everybody will present due to lack of time. Note that presenting doesn't have any influence on your grade either way. So um, I've put together a schedule now here with, in order, um, who will present on when or which groups will present on Wednesday. And um, in the number theory seminar, if you're interested, at I think 3.35 on Thursday, there will be a presentation by one of the grad students in the class and a postdoc, which will be on computing certain Bernoulli numbers. Um, they can, comp in case Ali didn't tell you, her code is now faster than David Harvey's. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm dope. As we discovered in office hours yesterday. Um, her algorithm was O of P squared, and his is O of P cubed, and you just had to make P big enough. So, so that's exciting. Um, and then these are the presentations for Friday. There are some people, oh, I think I need a... Oh, I forgot to change that one to none, because I think he doesn't want to present. Um, so don't worry if you're Jacob Lundgren. You're not, so um, still don't worry. Um, if you're one of the people that has a none next to your name, but you really do want to present, what? What's wrong? The StarCraft Oh, yeah. I guess you won't get to see that. Um, but if you're one of the people or projects with a none next to your name and you really want to you know, do a presentation, let me know and I can juggle something. Um, if you are assigned to give a presentation and you don't really feel like it, now that you see your name up there, you're kind of scared and nervous or whatever, um, feel free to let me know and I'll just move it down to none. It's totally optional. Um, the purpose of giving their presentations because it's fun and interesting and exciting um, for everybody. And if you look over this list, you'll see there are lots of interesting ones. I've basically um, grouped them by topic. So for example, it'll start with musical stuff, and there'll be a whole bunch of statistical type things, um, and then a little bit of combinatorics at the end. Um, there's some economics here as well. And then on Friday, there's um, something about a 3D graphics simulation of the solar system, and then there's uh, going to be a project about basically ballistics, so figuring out how to shoot a rifle efficiently. Um, some card game stuff and other games, Automata, a text adventure um, by Alexei Urmenko, and some cryptography stuff, and that's it. So there are quite a range of different projects, but there is some grouping of the topics. All right, so those are the projects which are coming up next week. Um, final projects, again, are due on Friday, March 9th, which is one week from today at midnight. The way you turn it in is exactly the same as how you turn in your homework. That is, you just email it to the same address you've been emailing your homework to. As usual, if you for some reason want to turn in your project early, like you're going to leave town on Tuesday, go ahead. It's fine. Uh, just finish your project by that time. Um, so that's certainly a reasonable thing to do. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today, if there aren't any questions, maybe there are questions. Yes? I mean, I'm like, so how is the grading kind of done on a project? I know for like so one issue, um, I will have a rough draft of your project tonight, and I am going to gr actually grade those before Wednesday, significantly before you turn in your project at least. So if I give you some specific feedback, like, you know, this is okay, but you really, really need to write a page about blah, and you completely ignore that feedback and turn in your final project, then that would be bad. <laughs> so it's roughly, I want to give you a very good grade, and I'm going to tell you how to get that grade when I grade your homework. Okay, it depends entirely on the project, I think. I, as you may have discovered, am generally a very generous grader, especially for this course, not for necessarily other courses, but for this course I am. And I want you to get a good grade on the final project, and I'll tell you how to do that 
when I look at your homework. Um, if you turn in a very, very minimal um, homework tonight, I mean, maybe reasonable, but really not that useful, then I won't really be able to give you very good feedback, and then that might you know, negatively impact your ability to get a good grade when you turn in something in a week. So I encourage you to turn in as much as you can um, tonight. So basically respond to the feedback I give you on the homework, which I agreed. Okay? Um, but as far as, I don't have any specific guidelines about how much, although you know, roughly the size of a Sage worksheet um, that I present in class is kind of what you should aim for. That might equate to five pages if you were to write a normal project, but um, some people could do a project which is you know, a one page long patch and that's the whole thing. That's possible as well. It really depends on the um, content of what you're, you're doing. And it, you know, for each project, it, it's kind of different. OK, uh, other questions? And I realize that written assignments in math classes are not very common. And that's the main reason why the homework assignment now is to turn in a rough draft. Because it's hard to calibrate what you need to do. And usually when I do anything with a written assignment in a math class, I'll have a rough draft that's due early where you can get a perfect grade on that, and then responding to the feedback is what you need to do to get a good grade on the final project. OK, and uh, just regarding grading, the final project is 30% of your grade. The homework was 50%. So obviously, a very important thing to do with your final project is to actually turn one in. <laughs> uh, because if you don't, then you'll definitely get a zero. Um, so do turn in a final project. OK, so um, what we'll talk about today is 3D plotting um, in kind of three parts. So first, there's documentation. If you click on that link, you'll see it. Um, I, when preparing this entire thing, I ended up never looking at that documentation directly, really. Um, I just ended up using question mark and looking at the names of functions, or at the doc strings for functions. And that was pretty much sufficient for everything I wanted to figure out. Um, the 3D plotting in Sage is pretty, pretty much written completely from scratch, mainly by me and Robert Bradshaw, with some uh, very significant inputs by um, a couple of other people, including Bill Kalshua, Couch, who was a freshman undergrad here when he did his work on 3D plotting. Um, so it's a kind of clean, self-contained code base written mostly in Cython, but with some Python code as well. Um, so that's the documentation. You may want to look through that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the different ways in which you can currently render 3D plots um, right now. That'll be really quick. And then I'll talk about all of the 3D plotting commands. Yes? Did you turn on the screencast? I have turned on the screencast. Thanks for the reminder. Maybe I'll double check that I really did. Um, if it says, yep, see, that's grayed out, which means there's currently a recording going on. Thanks for the reminder, though, because uh, it's important. OK, so first. Um, here is an example of 3D plotting. And um, there it is. This is a cube where the side colors of the cube are red, green, and blue. I know they don't look red, green, and blue to you because the projector sucks, but they look red, green, and blue to me on the screen right here. And if you, down, if you look at this worksheet on your own computer, you'll see that. Um, so maybe to calibrate your eyes, blackish murky is red. Green is pukish brown, and blue is blue. Okay, so just keep that in mind for the rest of the lecture, um, sadly. <clears throat> so that's a cube. Uh, there are many, many, and we'll see how many, in fact, um, different graphics primitives like this. Just like with 2D graphics, if you want to combine them together in the same scene, you just add them together. Um, and just like with 2D graphics, there's a whole bunch of options, most of which are common to all of the 3D graphics primitives, things like um, color and so on. And uh, you just pass them in as named arguments to the constructors. So there's um, other things like sphere. And this um, second example illustrates creating two spheres and then adding them together. Oops. So what I did here is I made a sphere. I made it with an opacity of 0.7. So it's somewhat transparent. I don't know if you can kind of see, but notice you can see through the red sphere a little bit. Uh, so red. Actually, no, this isn't red. This is, yeah, that's red. So they're both a little bit, yeah, it's blackish murky. And the blue one, um, that's the first one. I guess you should be able to see through that a little too. Yeah, I can see through. Maybe you can't tell, but there's a little, like, you can kind of see that there's an edge there. Um, so there's, that's another parameter you can set. Just to emphasize it, let's try 0.3. So I'll make it much, 
I'll make one of them far, far more transparent. And now you can see clearly that you can see through it. Okay? So um, that's just one of the many parameters. There's color, there's opacity. Yes? Okay, I'll, I'll talk about that right here. So, um, right. So why can you drag and rotate, and what other stuff can you do with this? So the default, as of today, um, renderer for 3D graphics is a Java applet called JMOL. Um, some quick background. So the, when we first introduced 3D graphics, um, the very beginning, the renderer was something called Tachyon, which is, or Tachyon 3D. It is um, a very lightweight, highly parallel 3D ray tracer that people in chemistry use for drawing molecules, um, static molecules. And so we just adapted it to work with Sage. We did this in, I think, 2006 or something, me and uh, Tom Boothby, who was an undergrad here at the time. And, uh, but unfortunately, the pictures that you get are just these static images. You can't drag them around or rotate them or anything. Um, also, there's no support at all for text. So there were some issues with Tachyon. But we used it for a while, and then one day I was reading a blog post. Um, there was a lot of people writing blog posts about Sage, and I was reading one of them, and I noticed a little 3D graphic embedded in their blog post about Sage, and it was like a little molecule that you could rotate around in 3D. So I did a little further investigation, and it turned out that, that um, chemists also had written a Java applet, which was free and open source, and had very minimal requirements on the part of the um, user. In fact, you didn't have to have any 3D acceleration support on your computer. So it would work on any browser with uh, jo support for Java applets. And that's what JML is. JML is entirely aimed at molecular visualization again. In fact, let's visit the JML website briefly. Um, right here. JML, an open source Java viewer for chemical structures in 3D. And that's not Java, but um, they have lots of examples, or samples, I guess. Demonstration pages. Um, I don't know, proteins, those are big, right? So, oh, Java plugin needs your permission. Uh, sure, I'm, I permit it. And then it downloads it and loads Java. Java happens and boom, there you are. So notice this is a some sort of protein. And the really unusual thing about JML compared to all the other 3D Java type options that we considered, and we did consider others and get others to work, is that JML actually doesn't use any 3D acceleration or any special 3D features of Java at all. It's purely using normal 2D Java drawing. They just wrote their own um, renderer that projects a 3D scene into 2D and displays it. So it's really completely software rendering of 3D. Um, that, especially in the older days when we first put that in, was a really important feature, actually, because a lot of computers didn't have good support for 3D acceleration, especially Linux boxes and stuff. So. Um, and the requirements on the part of scaring the heck out of the user were lesser with this. Um, Java can access directly fast 3D accelerated graphics support on a computer, but typically what happens is you have to click, you know, I agree to so many different frightening dialogues that you kind of get scared off and you don't want to actually use it. Um, and the amount of the size of stuff you have to download can be pretty bad. There is a library called Java 3D that does do 3D accelerated rendering in Java, um, and you can give it primitives, and we do have a renderer for it, but Nobody really uses it because it's really big and hard to install and scary. Um, so anyway, so we ended up just taking this thing that was from molecular visualization and figuring out via clever tricks how to make it draw mathematical stuff. Okay, so that is the JML render. That's where it comes from, and you'll see it a lot in this presentation. Um, there are some caveats, though. Do not have too many of these displayed at once. Um, if you do, well, basically, web browsers have this hard limit on how much memory they'll allocate to Java applets in a page. Each one of these takes a few hundred, potentially 100 megabytes, maybe a, you know, 50 megabytes or 100 megabytes. If you have 20 or 30 of them open, you start running into memory limits. And it doesn't, your web browser will just, you know, silently not work right. So um, in hope of not having that happen, I'm, if you click to the left of output, it toggles whether it's displayed or not, and you can just make these not displayed. Um, that may be a good idea. Um, another significant issue with JMOL is that it doesn't work at all on iPhones, and surely never will, because I guess 
Steve Jobs' dying wish was that iPhones can never ever do anything with Java. So, um, <laughs> so it's written in stone. iPhones will not support Java. I mean, that, I mean, Jobs are turning his grave if that ever changed. Um, it doesn't work with Android tablets either. I don't know why because they support Java extremely well. Um, but it's an observable fact if you pull out an Android tablet and try to use JML graphics that they don't seem to work. Um, there's no a priori reason why they don't. Um, and one should definitely be able to run JMO locally on uh, Android tablets. This, I mean, Android the operating system supports Java very well, but it doesn't actually work. So, um, it'll, but it'll probably never work on iPhones, which is or iPads, which is kind of annoying. It's kind of seriously annoying. You're trying it on a yeah, exactly. So that's annoying. Um, there are alternative renders. I mentioned Tachyon a minute ago, and in fact, um, I'll show you that you can use this. So here's the same plot, but let's instead render it using Tachyon. All you do is you change the um, viewer to be Tachyon instead of um, JMOL. JMOL is the default, but you can change it to Tachyon. And then it will get rendered using Tachyon. Now this Tachyon rendering is just a PNG image. Like if you, if you right click on it, it's save image as, you can't drag it around or anything. Yes, your head is up. This is the other problem with JMO. Yeah, Despite it supposed to be a Java applet with low, res low requirements that just works, um, I have often, in my own experience and on other people's computers, observed it not just working. And I think it's highly annoying that it doesn't work very well in practice. Is it a web browser usually, issue? Usually, um, it'll always be a web browser issue or an operating system issue. For example, if you're using Linux, which you probably are not, given that you have a, a Mac there, um, you have to have Java installed on your computer. Java, due to weird licensing issues and Sun and Oracle, blah, 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 um, and the GPL, blah, 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 blah. Um, basically, Java isn't that well supported under Linux compared to what you might expect um, and compared to what Sun and Oracle would want you to believe. So there can be a lot of issues with installing Java. Um, and I think they even, there was some weird licensing thing recently where a certain version of Java got automatically uninstalled off of all the Ubuntu machines out there in the world, which um, was exactly the version we needed in order to run JML. So um, it's really a problem. Um, on OS X, uh, I think at least up through 10.6, OS X just came with a Java, I mean, with a Java virtual machine and had very good support for it. I think with 10.7, you have to install something separately. Like, it doesn't actually come with Java, which is a weird surprise. Um, so it may be that you don't have it, but um, it could be just that your your browser's configured in a funny way. You might want to try one of you might want to try Chrome or Firefox or Safari, whichever one you're not using right now. <laughs> so I don't. I'm obviously very annoyed by Shamal, as you can yeah. tell, and Firefox you'll crashed. you'll see my next remark. When yeah. I tried, when I tried to put 3D, Firefox crashed. For example, yeah. so. JML sucks, right? That's the conclusion. <laughs> it looks really good, and you'll see that I have it set it up just right today. I spent like 30 minutes getting it to actually work on here. And, well, I was using some, uh, I'm using a beta version of Sage and a beta version of the notebook, and I hadn't installed the right JML stuff into it. But it does work fine for me here, and it looks really, really good. It works well, but there are some serious problems with it not working well on various people's machines. And um, I'll say more about that in a second. It seems like there are more hands up. Yes? So Tachyon, can you... Make it look at a different angle. Yes, um, which I don't have illustrated anywhere in here. What you can do is you could say there are various, given an, a 3D object G, you can do G dot um, translate, G dot rotate. So for example, you can rotate um, V theta. So you have to give a vector and an angle. So just I'll give it a random vector and a random angle. And now I'll show that one. And it will look from, it'll be from a different perspective. So programmatically, you can apply an arbitrary transformation to the scene before rendering it. You can also zoom in and out um, by doing like zoom equals, I don't know, you can change the zoom factor. I have an interact at wiki.sagemouth.org. It's an example of an interact which gives you controls that allow you to rotate around by clicking buttons, a 3D scene that's displayed using Tachyon. But every time you have to wait you know, a second for it to render it and redisplay it. But yes, you can, and that's how. Okay, um, another renderer that's very well supported in Sage is Canvas 3D. And to use that, it's, you know, it's the same thing. You just say viewer equals Canvas 3D. Um, and let's do it. Unfortunately, it's a wireframe. 
So the history of Canvas 3D, um, this is using HTML5's Canvas 2D, actually not 3D, despite the name being Canvas 3D. Um, a couple of years ago, a freshman, Bill Cowshaw, who I mentioned before, came to me and wanted to do a summer project, and I suggested, hey, write a 3D renderer in uh, HTML5 that will work on anything and that has HTML5 support. And he liked that idea because I guess his brother writes video games, so he has uh, 3D graphics programming in his blood. And uh, he wrote this. And it just, unfortunately, it's, you know, it's only wireframe, so it's a little bit annoying. But it does allow you to render 3D graphics. And the cool thing about this is it works on iPhones, it works on Android tablets, it doesn't crash your browser. Um, it works on your computer in the back, probably, um, et cetera. So there are some really nice things about it. It's really, really lightweight, um, et cetera. So let's see, did I leave out any advantages of it? Um, but the big disadvantage is it's, you know, it's just a, it's a couple, you know, like two months work by a freshman, so it doesn't, which has never been worked on by anybody else. No offense to freshman, he's a really, really, really extraordinary programmer, but um, it just needs a lot more work to really be the thing to use. And it's not like a really, really um, unique idea these days, so it, maybe at the time it was, but nowadays um, he's not the only person that decided, hey, I want to write a thing that will render 3D scenes using the HTML5 2D canvas. Because it's HTML5 2D canvas, it's something that many, many browsers now support that lets you draw really fast 3D, or sorry, really fast 2D graphics. It has lots of primitives. You can just do everything you want to do with 2D graphics, so you can write such a render. Um, there are dozens of people who have done this. And um, there are plenty of projects, um, and they do it much better than this, in fact. Like, they're much more powerful today. I think the best one is called 3.js, and I'll just show you what that looks like. Um, oh, that's a track ticket for including it in Sage. Um, track is obviously, oh, it's connection limit exceeded. What the heck? What? No, no, this is... Um, there's a database that runs on some computer in the basement of the math building that serves up track, and there's a limit on the number of simultaneous connections. And I guess track is very popular since there's so many people working on Sage, um, and it, it exceeded the limit for a few seconds. Okay, so basically this is uh, about including Sage um, 3JS in Sage, and here's an example which illustrates how it actually is going to work, or at least shows that it's possible. And uh, importantly, here's the actual 3JS website right here coming up. And in fact, some of you have been playing around with 3JS. What do you think? Pretty, pretty, cool. pretty cool. Hey, does it work on, does it crash your computer? Um, well, when you have like 35,000 particles, it tries to, but it actually still keeps going. Whereas JMO would surely crash your computer. <laughs> <laughs> or at least it would look really bad. So here's some examples of 3JS. Here's what 3JS does in short. It um, will do really, really nice accelerated, beautiful 3D rendering using um, hardware acceleration if uh, you have a new enough computer with a nice enough web browser. If not, then you can fall back to doing 2D rendering, or what, it'll do 3D rendering on a 2D canvas, just like the thing that Bill had written, but it's much more sophisticated. So you can write your graphics in such a way that it might be really slow when you try to view it on the iPhone today, but it'll be super fast and powerful on your desktop. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. And just to give you an example, um, this one right here? No, oh, this one right here, okay. You guys like this one? Oh, crap. Oh, the bubbles. Well, I clicked on that one. Uh, maybe I, didn't, I don't know. Let's see. WebGL cube. Okay, so here's an example of 3JS. These are a bunch of spheres that are going around in circles, and they have you know, reflections. It's really fast, and etc. So this is not at all available in Sage yet, but someday it will be. Hopefully it will, I plan to work on this a bunch in, um, I plan to work on that a bunch in April. Okay, so that's what's going on with 3D graphics. So the main thing that might change in the future is that the renderer will hopefully change from JML to something more robust. Otherwise, everything's gonna work just like what I'm gonna show you today, okay? Um, by the way, you can set defaults. So um, if you keep writing viewer equals tachyon or something like that, and you keep changing the figure size, um, you can do that once and for all. You can set the aspect ratio, the zoom, all kinds of things once and for all by setting um, key values of the dictionary show defaults. 
And I'm studying the viewer de tachyon, though. As you'll see, um, most of the time I'll actually explicitly say jmol in this talk. OK, here are the available 3D plotting commands. Um, there they are. I'll give them to you by groups. There are um, commands for plotting the platonic solids. Really, it's the boundaries of the solids. So you can plot a tetrahedron, a cube. You saw a cube before. Octahedrons, dodecahedrons, and icosahedrons. It's nice to have. Um, you can plot points. It's kind of a zero-dimensional object, though. And it really is, in a sense, zero-dimensional the way they're plotted in um, some of the renderers, in that if you zoom in, the point doesn't actually get bigger. You give it a specific size, but no matter how close you zoom in, it's still that size. Um, there's one-dimensional plotting stuff, so you can draw arrows, um, bezier spines, um, 3D lines, parametric plotting of uh, a curve going through space. You can plot vector fields, and you can plot uh, text in 3D. There's also some two-dimensional plotting, so you can do cylindrical plots, implicit plots. Um, list plot allows you to um, give a bunch of points, and it'll interpolate a surface that goes through those points, which is very important for um, applied type applicate type situations. Um, parametric plot 3D, on which many of these other ones are implemented, which uh, basically you give a couple of functions, and they trace out a surface in 3D. And plot 3D, which plots a function f of xy, uh, polygon 3D, revolution plot 3D, spherical plot 3D. You can take a 2D plot and embed it in 3D. So if you have a normal, like a plot of the sine function or something, you can just stick it as a layer inside of uh, 3D. And uh, that's it. So now let me just show you examples that illustrate each of these. Okay. So first, um, here are the platonic solids. <clears throat> there's a cube. Hey, yellow looks yellow. Great. And there's red. Again, green, <laughs> um, and orange. <laughs> OK, so those are the that's a nice icosahedron, et cetera. And now here we can add these all together. And again, it's just using plus. Notice that um, unlike above, what I did was I give the centers of these. So um, that's the first argument. It's the center in three-dimensional space. And then I just show them all together. The nice thing about JMOL, uh, when it works, JMOL is really nice in that it gives you the ability to rotate the object around, fully supports transparency. It does have some cool features. If you right click or if you manage to right click, then there's a menu that comes up. And you can set things like the style to be, uh, one thing you do is stereographic, so you can do cross-eyed viewing, for example, which can be kind of fun. Um, I want to zoom out. And then apparently, if you were to cross your eyes appropriately, you would see this really in 3D, if you're one of those people that does that. Um, I don't know. Maybe I need to, to move it or something. There's also a 3D um, glasses mode, which is another thing in the same menu that I was just showing you. And there's a way to um, do spin on. So you can just you know set it spinning. Um, and I think those three features, there's a lot of things in the menu, but those are the, the main things that are nice. And when somebody, impl me, I guess, um, implements 3D graphics using 3JS, we'll want to provide a menu with those same features. One thing you can't do very easily is interact with the scene, like pick a specific object in the scene. Um, there's really no good way to do that, in my opinion, right now, um, unfortunately. With 3JS, there should be, because 3JS has good support for picking objects out of a scene. Basically, you click on an object, and it calls a JavaScript function, and then that can do something. And you can also move objects around and stuff. But that's, that's not supported with the current 3D graphics setup. OK, so let me turn off spinning, because that really, really uses a lot of CPU resources, actually. Woo. OK, I'm zooming in. All right, and now I'll hide that. So that's platonic solids, which was the first list. Um, just for fun, here's a bunch of uh, a thousand randomly chosen platonic solids, kind of randomly placed, all rendered on top of each other, which will appear in a moment. Um, this is being rendered using the ray tracer. I think it takes about 20 or 30 seconds. Um, it, one of the key things about the ray tracer is it's supposed to be highly parallel, but when I look here at uh, the tracer, it only shows one thread being used, which is really annoying, because the whole point of it is supposed to be very parallel. Um, I think it's probably misbuilt for OS X. Um, anyways, 
here it is. So it's kind of fun. There is a very colorful collection of polytopes, or of um, regular, um, regular ones. So there you are. Okay, uh, here's the point command. Not too exciting. A point will appear. There it is. Look. And um, you can set the size of the point. And then you can also, here's an example of drawing a bunch of, this is kind of fun. Um, I'm drawing a bunch of random points on a surface. So I just chose 500 random points, and they're on the surface z equals x times cosine of pi xy cubed. And this is one where rotating around is you know, really helpful. So you can see that there's a surface there. And of course, seeing this, you might think, oh, maybe I could set the color of the point to somehow indicate some aspect of the plot that I'm drawing. And in fact, I'll do that next. So here's what I've done. I, um, I'll make a plot where I compute 2,000 random points um, on, this, on the strip from 0 to 1 and 0 to 30, view those points in the complex plane. I compute the value of the Riemann zeta function at those points, and I get a bunch of complex numbers. For each of those complex numbers, I plot a point, but I make the height of the point be the absolute value of the complex number, and I make the color of the point be determined by the argument of the complex number. So you get a genuine plot of the Riemann zeta function, which is missing no information. And here it is. So that's the, the Riemann zeta function on the critical strip. Um, and you can see that it, it goes down to zero at certain points. I don't know. I, can you kind of see that? Basically, it's where, it, where it's uh, minimal here. Those are points where the Riemann zeta function has zeros. So this is an example of a plot of a complex function at a bunch of randomly chosen points. And the color is telling you the angle, and the height is telling you the absolute value of the, of the complex number. So I'm using the hue function. The hue function takes a real number between 0 and 1 and gives you back a color. And uh, if you read the documentation for hue, you'll see how that's defined. But it's some color that varies between you know, red and green. <laughs> you can also just use RGB values um, if you want. OK, uh, things are starting to feel slow, so I will hide that. All right, moving on. One-dimensional plotting commands. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Not so good. Um, One-dimensional plotting commands include 3D arrows, uh, 3D bezier splines, uh, etc., uh, 3D parametric plotting, and vector fields. Let me just show you some of these. Um, here are a couple of arrows. See? Arrows turn out to be really, really helpful for illustrating stuff, especially in physics and calculus and so on. So there you are. Um, bezier 3D. Uh, there's code in the numerical parts of Sage that make it easy to compute Bezier spines and stuff like that, so I uh, might as well be able to plot them, and here's an example of one. Uh, and here what happens is the input is a, a list of lists, and they get somehow combined together into one big spine. spline. Um, here's a 3D line, which is just a line that connects various points. So it starts at the point 1, 2, 3, and then it goes to the point 1, 0, minus 2, etc. And just for fun, I made a, um, or actually, I copied an example from the documentation. This is uh, an example of a bunch of interlocking tetrahedra that um, was made by using the line command in different colors. So that's really pretty. Okay. Um, here's something I made. So if you use the stats.time series class, you can make uh, a bunch of random numbers that are normally distributed with mean 0 and standard deviation 0 0.05. And if you um, add them up, so each number is really small, but when you add them up, you get um, numbers that get bigger and smaller. And then exponentiate them, you get a um, get geometric Brownian motion. So that looks like that. Now let's just do it in 3D instead of 1D. And here's what it looks like. I just computed three, val three um, sequences of 1,000 numbers in this way, and I'll call them x, y, and z, and then I put them together to make a single line in three-dimensional space, pretty much at random, 
and here's what I get. It's kind of a 3D version of the picture above. So it's a particle, it's you know moving around, jittering around like this. Um, if I switch it to viewer equals jmol, it will uh, also should also work. And this is kind of nice because then you can you know, really rotate it around and see what's going on. And each time I do this, it'll look a bit different because it's random. Uh, come on. Why isn't the top going away? That's weird. Come on, Chrome. Oh, that's weird. Um, okay. So, yeah, here's another one. So you can see that you get this little, like, random walk in three-dimensional space. Okay. Um, here's an example of a parametric plot in 3D. You give the x, y, and z coordinates as a function of some parameter, and then it draws the curve that you get. If you were to give two functions, I'm mean, sorry, if you were to give two parameters instead of one, then it would make a surface instead of a curve. Um, but I'll show you that later. And there are a lot of really cool surfaces you can draw that way. Um, here's an example of plotting a vector field. So at each point you give a vector, and you give the range of values you want to vary over. So you can see that's a nice vector field, which could be useful for maybe illustrating something involving partial or differential equations of various forms. Okay. And actually, I guess that's... Where are they? Three? I'm not sure what, why they're, what the different colors mean, actually. Okay. Um, here's an example of text. And the key thing to note with text, first, it doesn't work at all with tachyon. So if you try it out and it just doesn't work, it's because you're using tachyon. Um, so watch out. Notice that when you rotate the scene around, the text still faces you. It would be kind of annoying if, you know, when you rotated the scene, suddenly the letters went sideways. Um, so that's not what happens. Moreover, if you zoom in and out, the text size doesn't change. In fact, there's no po as far as I can tell, there's no way to change the text size. It's that size. Um, I don't. I couldn't. There's no like font size option or anything. So that's the size of text. Uh, but it's really useful for you know labeling things. So you just give the uh, text and where you want it and the color. That's all you can do. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention get image. So if, um, if you want to take a 3D plot, rotate it around, and then include it in some other document, um, one thing you can do is rotate it to the position you want. So maybe like right there. And then click get image. What will happen is a window pops up. And then the image is rendered, but it's a static um, PNG file now. And you can just do save image as. Yes? No. There is no support for outputting um, 3D graphics in any vector format at present. I wish there were, as far as I know. Uh, OK, now two-dimensional. So here's parametric plotting, but um, where you have two parameters. So instead of getting a curve, you get a three-dimensional surface. Well, actually, sorry, a two-dimensional surface, silly, embedded in three-dimensional space. So this thing's really hollow inside, um, but it's it's cut out by these functions. And you know, just to show you that we have some control over this, I'll just you know, do something kind of silly and see it kind of changes a little bit. Um, so, anyways, it's a parametric plot. Um, if you can parametrize a surface, then you can plot it. And here's another example of a parametric plot. So this one looks really pretty. It's kind of like a little spirally you thing. Yeah, you did it in red. Oh, crap. Not red. Uh, it's really pretty. Uh, I guess blue is one of the best colors to use. Blue. OK, so see? It's kind of neat. And it's, it's somewhat transparent, so you can see through it. Um, trust me. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, you can draw nice 3D plots like this. Okay, um, here's plot 3D. This just takes a symbolic expression and um, plots z equals f of xy for a given range of xy values. And there it is. So this has a little bump right here, and then it goes down right there. Um, 
Yeah, it's not so good there. Um, it might be better with J, uh, viewer equals jmol. I don't know. Because then I can move it around. Okay. Let's see, here's a cylindrical plot. So this is plotting in cylindrical coordinates. And here is a revolution plot. So a surface of revolution. And you can see a little curve going up it, hopefully. OK. Um, here's a spherical plot. It's supposed to look like a heart, but it looks like a blob because the color's red. Um, maybe I'll there you are. So hopefully you can kind of see that. Um, list plot 3D. So this is just one example, but um, if you end up trying to deal with a lot of data and you want to visualize it in 3D, this is very likely the thing you're going to end up using. So remember that, since odds are you're probably going to be doing that. Um, so it's list plot 3D. Uh, what happens is you give it a whole bunch of points in space, and you can choose from one of many different interpolation modes. It goes off, it takes the, the data, uses um, SciPy to interpolate between the data and make a surface, and then it plots the surface. So I uh, definitely know about this. Um, turns out to be super useful for people in practice, especially doing numerical type work. So that's just a silly example with random points. But uh, in practice, this is one of the most important things to know about if you're doing 3D visualization. Uh, there's a polygon here. Um, notice you can rotate that around. And polygons are a good thing to build up more complicated shapes out of. Here's implicit plot 3D, which I promised before. This is the 3D analog of what we talked about last time. So here what happens, um, you give it a function, and it plots the zero locus of that function. And in this particular example, that's, this is what the zero locus looks like. So if you have, you know, say an algebraic surface in, and you want to see what it looks like in three-dimensional space, you can use implicit plot, and it'll draw a plot of the thing, or whatever else. Um, apparently it's a handy thing to be able to do. And it's pretty, it's extremely fast when the input, just like before, exactly like what I said before, when the input is a symbolic expression, it, as opposed to a Python function, or possibly the input is a function you define in Cython, then it will be very fast. And like before, um, you can give a number of plot points. So what it does is it takes your expression and it evaluates it on a three-dimensional grid. So it, in this case, it evaluates at 40 cubed different points. And then it uses some algorithm with a fancy name to interpolate through um, all those points and come up with something that actually looks like a surface with a nice triangulation and uh, displays it. Um, the actual implementation of this was done from scratch in Sage, um, written in Cython, and uh, the, basically half of the work was done by this guy, Carl Witte, who works or worked at um, Newton Labs, which is a place that does computer vision down in Renton, and uh, he kind of got tired of working on it, handed it off, and then uh, a Bill Cal Choice, who I mentioned before, um, finished it off and got it into Sage. So that's where this code comes from. But it's very powerful, and um, because of the compiler that turns a symbolic expression into something that can be evaluated quickly, um, this doesn't really take that long, even if you have a large number of points in each direction. So you know, if, we want, if we want to make this smoother, say 60 points, it's not going to take an inordinate amount of time at all. Um, it's really reasonably fast. Again, before the compiler thing, you would evaluate it, you know, 60 cube points, and it's just ridiculously slow. Um, the compiler led to speed ups of a factor of you know, 10,000 to a million in practice. It was really, really dramatic. Um, you can embed a 2D plot in 3D. So here's an example where I make a plot that involves, um, well, I just plot the sine function. Given pretty much any 2D plot, you can say dot plot 3D. And what it does is it takes your 2D plot and just sticks it as the xy plane in 3D. There's an option, um, which is the only option to the plot 3D command, which lets you move it up or down. And if you want to move it anymore, you can use translate or um, rotate, like I showed you before. So here, I took a sphere, which is red, 
the sine function, which I just stuck as the xy plane, and then I took the cosine function, plotted from 0 to 10, colored it in black, and made that <coughs> translate up by 1. So see, so you now have two um, 2D plots sitting inside of 3D space along with a sphere. Okay? So um, if you have, you know, if you want to have, if you wanted to look at 10 different 2D plots all next to each other, kind of sitting in space, you can do that easily just by saying dot plot 3D. Um, but watch out, there are a couple of basic primitives that won't be supported. So you can try using plot 3D on any 2D plot, and many things work, but there are a few that it won't work on. Um, I'm not sure of any in particular, but I'm pretty, but I'm certain it's not going to work on all of them. Because uh, basically, for every single primitive, we had to write a renderer, where we means Robert Bradshaw wrote a renderer that would render them in 3D. And um, I'm sure that, you know, that hasn't been carried out in complete generality. Okay, and now finally, um, here's an example of a model with 53,756 vertices of Yoda. So it's um, taking that model and then drawing it using the tachyon ray tracer. And the way you get the model, so the model, you can find these um, models on the web. This is in MATLAB format. And using scipy.io, or from scipy import io, io.loadmat, which loads a matrix in MATLAB format, um, it's loaded the matrix from this file, which is attached to the worksheet. And then using indexed face set, which is something on which a lot of the 3D plotting is built, it draws the plot. Um, and you can see it, you know, it looks pretty good. You can also draw exactly the same one using um, JMOL, and that has a nice advantage that you can rotate it around, you know, and you can hold it and move it around in real time. So, and it gives a sense of how fast JMOL is, even though it's faking the 3D stuff. Okay, and thus concludes the lectures of Math 1062. Done. On time. I finished two minutes early. Okay, so remember, next week we'll reconvene on Wednesday for the first group of final project presentations. And feel free to write lots of emails to me before then about your projects and questions that you might have. Okay. How was Vancouver? How was Vancouver? Oh, you didn't go? You went to Vancouver. You went to Vancouver, but he didn't come. Okay. How about those Fontaine rings? I've been working on Skew Pong in this week. Question? I would love to plug this in and see if I get any of my colors out when I just. Oh, good question. Go for it.